أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى علي محمد. <coughs> so I want to make this video on the the material dialectic of Muslim history and. If you're familiar with the idea of dialectical materialism, which is basically the idea that every thesis has an antithesis, and so every order or value organized hierarchy that is established on earth, for example, the free, mar free market ca uh, hierarchy of capitalist or uh, you know the democratic hierarchy of nations or whatever it is any hierarchy or order that's established will inherently have some flaws and those flaws will ultimately manifest themselves sometime after that that order has reached its zenith or its pinnacle the flaws within that order will begin to manifest themselves and when those flaws manifest themselves, there will be an antithesis <clears throat> to the presuppositions of that order or that civilization. And that antithesis will then overcome the now falling previous order and come up with a more improved order that addresses the flaws of the previous nation. And, and it will go to its zenith and when it starts to fall its flaws will become manifest and then there will be another process and that process will continue itself, right? And so, Muhammad Iqbal took this idea, this a philosophical idea and as a Muslim, it makes sense if any, the, every, any order that exists on earth like democracy or communism or whatever it is is not based or derived from the Quran then it will ultimately fail right so because it will ultimately fail i mean i mean because it's not derived from the quran so this process of dialectical materialism like thesis antithesis thesis antithesis this process is going toward a perfect order it's going toward an order which is as perfect as it's possible to be but it's kind of like the aqal trying to get to what the Qur'an says before the Qur'an is revealed. Right? So Allah can send knowledge down and our aqal can grasp for the knowledge going up. But we cannot have perfect knowledge until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends it down. Our aqal cannot actually arrive there. And so this, this thesis, antithesis, you know, capitalism, communism, socialism, you know, this this like back and forth will continue until we reach the perfect system. We can't actually leave the leave, uh, reach the perfect system. We can only approach it philosophically. But fortunately, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has sent down the Quran. Right. So dialectical materialism. You have to understand that process. Now that you understand that process, we can go into the dialectical, the material dialectic of Muslim history. So basically the role of revelation and religion is to raise us beyond this dialectical materialistic process, to make us be able to transcend it. Salam means to transcend this process. And of course, before Allah, when Allah had only created the angels, there was nothing to disobey Allah. So the salam of the universe existed, the salam of creation. But when he created jinn, the jinn did khata and the jinn did fitna. And so when the jinns did zulm, uh, you know, there was all sorts of flaws that were introduced into the creation of Allah, all sorts of evil that was introduced. Right? Then Allah destroyed them and he took Iblis up and then he created Bani Adam and then Bani Adam did the same thing. We did our khata. And so whenever we do khata, there's evil that's created in the dunya, that's why Allah made something haram. Because it would create zulm in the dunya, it would create evil in the dunya. Right? And so basically what Nabuwa and Rasalat is supposed to do is Adam al-Islam made a khata, we fell, 
And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the khatam, khatam of the Anbiya is supposed to raise us back and establish salam perfectly and totally uh, upon the earth again, right? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did that, right? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually established that perfect salam on the dunya. But the way it fell again, that is the the, the real, the topic of this video is uh, the the material dialectic of Muslim history is reinitiated after Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. Now the Sunnis really want to say it happened after the fitan and before the fitan the four khulafa were perfect. Obviously not, you know. And so we have to really analyze the first four khulafa. And I, I respect those sahaba, but I put khulafa in quotation marks for a reason, we'll get to that. And so the khata of, of you know, we have to look at what happened at after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that reintroduced error into the system. What introduced error back into the system? And what introduced error back into the system is that Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyanhu made ijtihad when ijtihad was unnecessary. Hazrat Abu Umar radiyanhu made ijtihad when ijtihad was not necessary. Sayyidina Ali was nafs Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was alayhi salam according to Bukhari. Um, I believe that the 12 khulafa the, the, from the Ahlul Bayt the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the real intended, the real true khulafa of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were Mahdiyun and Rashidun. What that means is their Wahiyah Khafi was mehfuz because they were Tahir, their nafs was purified, so they weren't Masum, meaning that they weren't born, you know, without Khata, but they were purified. They were Mutahir. And because they were mutahir, their wahiya khafi in tahveel of the wahiya jali, which is the Quran, was perfectly mahfuz. So they were mahdi, they were rashidun, they were mahdiyun, and they were hadi. Right? They were they were mahdiyun and hadi. And because they were mahdiyun and hadi, uh, they didn't need ijtihad. They were like the anbiya in this regard. That they didn't need ijtihad. That's not what they do. And Salafis like using ijtihad for even Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I don't think it's appropriate, really, because everything he's doing is based upon wahiya khafi. So it's not ijtihad. Even if he's using his intellect, even then there's wahiya khafi that is coming down. You know, so ijtihad is not proper. He's wahiya khafi, and so the ijtihad of Hazrat Abu Bakr you know, it is not the issue. His ijtihad was a good one and he was looking at the masliyat of the ummah and the masliyat of ikamatuddin and he wasn't his ijtihad wasn't wrong and it wasn't zalim but after nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam only the ahle bayt can have a perfectly pure purification only the ahle bayt after nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam have the potential to have a perfect purification and so Sayyidina Ali had that perfect purification, Sayyidina Fatima had it, Sayyidina Hassan and Hussein, even when they were too young for Khilafah then, they had it, right? Hazrat Abu Bakr they know it was not possible for him to have it because he wasn't Ali Bayt. And so the mistake, the khata began, the small Latif khata that could have been prevented or or overcome if if Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu had eventually given the khilafah to Sayyidina Ali. But what happened was that when when Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu took the bayah, but he didn't seek it when it was given to him. There was a flaw that was reintroduced into the system just by that happening. Now this is only about Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu. Hazrat Umar radiyallahu had a bigger part in Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu becoming Khalifa than Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu had himself. And then the other Sahaba gave him bayah. He didn't seek it. He didn't take it. It was given to him, right? But that is where the Latif Latif uh, Khata begins in the system, and it cascades all the way to Karbala. You know, there's a chain of causation that happens. And it's basically Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu you know, makes Hazrat Umar radiyallahu Khalifa when he passes away. Hazrat Umar radiyallahu makes Muawiyah governor of Sham, and then Muawiyah is a baghi against Sayyidina Ali, right? And and then then Muawiyah also makes his son Yazid into the the Amir after he passes away, and then 
uh, who's khula, who's uh, what does Yazid do? He does the Karbala, and so there's a direct chain of causation from Hazrat Abu Bakr radhiyallahu to Muawiyah and uh, Yazid, and then you know Karbala. Not that it was the Niya or Hazrat Abu Bakr radhiyallahu would himself ever do something like that. No, but as a consequence of his decision, it happened. And despite all of this, despite the maslihat of the ijtihad of Hazrat Abu Bakr radhiyallahu, the whole Khilafah only lasted 27, 28 years. Not even a full 30, you know. So looking at the maslihat obviously doesn't work when you're talking about keeping the deen mahfuz because when you look at maslihat instead of haq then the deen is already compromised and it cannot sustain itself when you think pragmatically rather than justly then the deen is already compromised so what happened after this the dialectic of materialism is that after the fitan when muawiyah happened the iman was so weak at that point that after everything that had happened that you know the the proto sunnis accepted that oh muawiyah is king now and you cannot challenge the king you cannot challenge someone who has the power to keep the power so they become pragmatic on on the highest level of legal theory political theory and from there on Sunniism became more and more pragmatic for the next 1400 years and the real foundation of Sunniism was laid when Muawiyah took the power and the, and the Sahaba or whoever was present, the big ulama of the time, they, they just accepted it even though they knew it was wrong that he wasn't the one who was supposed to be there. They, they accepted it and they made excuses for it and they rationalized it that they should they should accept it now and not fight it you know and so that rationalization was the beginning of pragmatism in Islam and really like a solid one and 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 one that was kind of selfish and then it became more and more strong for the next 1400 years until we have the same situation the Muawiyah situation repeating itself in Saudi Arabia the Sauds are like Muawiyah you know, and despite you know there being Ahlibayat and Mu'minin and Adilin in in there, you know the zul, the zulm of Muawiyah and Banu Umayyah is happening again in Saudi Arabia. Now, what happened is that the real Ahle Haq were the original Ahle Tashi. The real Ahle Haq were the people who were with Sayyidina Ali, who were with Sayyidina Hassan, Sayyidina Hussein, Sayyidina Zainul Abidin, the real loyal people who were with the ahl the 12 ahl Amirs or you know the, the real Khulafa, the Rashidin, the real Khulafa, Mahdiin, the 12 Khulafa, the 12 Umara. These 12, they were the on haq, you know. But, you know, in response to Muawiyah's pragmatism, there needed to be an idealistic opposite, an idealistic polarity. Sayyidina Ali and the ahl or the Adil in the middle, in the center but one thrift you have Muawiyah's pragmatism so you need the idealistic extreme in opposite to it to fraction off and so the Khwarij were the original idealist and it may be funny that you know there's Christian idealism and Sufi idealism and the Khwarij were some crazy type of idealist you know completely different and it's true because it was a response Sunnis don't understand how big of a deal how bad Muawiyah is how evil was what he did you know a Muslim a Sunni Muslim don't want to acknowledge how evil Muawiyah's action is okay you don't want to call him evil and this and that but his action you undervalue the evil of the action of Muawiyah right and so in response to that pragmatics polarization and sham there needed to be an idealistic extreme to balance it out because this is the akhri, this is the ummah that the last ummah so that will always be in the case of the ummah you will have the brailvis really emphasize tasbi and you will have the salafis really emphasize tanzi you know and in in the same way in every mamla you know some people will go to the extreme and tawassul and some people will go to the other extreme and tawassul right? there will always be mamlat and people will go to the extremes to balance each other out so the same balancing happened once muawiyah established the proto sunni pragmatic kind of sham you needed the khwarij to go rebel also against sayyidina ali in the opposite direction right so the khwarij were the original idealists but what happened is the, the, the Shia Tun Ali, 
the real ones were the, the ones who had the real deen they had the real salam and adal from allah but after the 12th imam right who was the brother of the 11th imam not the son there was no son there's no imam al mahdi and khalwat but the 11th son you know the the brother of the 11th imam the 12th imam after he passed away there was no more ahle salam and completely mutahir sayyid imams anymore on the earth there were still very highly purified sayyid imams but that level of perfect purity was lifted for whatever hikma from allah subhanahu wa taala now we had purification but not to the same degree as we had before the perfect purification one in every generation the imam we no longer had that we will when imam al mahdi comes but we didn't have it then so what happened is now you have these two extremes and you have the middle the, the ahle bayt and their shia and then in on one extreme we have the sunni is proto sunni muawiya and then you have the idealistic khwarij the quran will make a decision how will the quran make a decision here's the book it's not saying anything of course someone has to communicate the decision someone has to make the decision from the quran anyways but notice that sayyidna ali did not make takfir of either muawiya or his followers or of the khwarij sayyidna ali didn't do that because sayyidna ali recognized that if the khwarij or kuffar then also or muawiya you know because the the khwarij are only a antithesis they're responding they don't understand you know it is actually muawiya who is the the sinner and they are only like responding psychologically and you know the people who follow ali have the most hikma and they can balance it but you know those people who are naive in some way idealistic in some way they cannot understand what is happening with muawiya so they go to the other extreme okay so that's the dialectical materialism so what happens is after the 12th imam shiaism because it's facing it is the direct opposition of Sunniism, right? And there's no more Adil Imam to guide them, really. No more uh, Masum, but I say purified, mutahir Imam, perfectly purified Imam to guide them. What happens is that those group of people, they, in order, they they keep their individual like distinct identity. But what happens is that they separate as the as kind of like the minority in Sunni lands. They become more and more extreme. Sunniism and Shiaism. emerge as polarizations to each other you know and then within each <clears throat> and so what happens is shiism gradually because it's it's the main opposition to sunni pragmatism slowly shiism becomes idealistic do you so shia idealism and sunni pragmatism and what happens to the ibadi is because the, the, the or the the muhakkima or the, what we call the khwarij is now they're out and the real competition is between the shia and the sunni so over time the ibadis become centrist they study from the shia they study from the sunni and they become kind of like centrist but the shia they were the original idealists but then they become the centrist over time and if you look there's a quite a difference between the original khwarij the original muhakkima and and the uh, ibadi of today there's quite a big difference and you can see that over time they went from being the idealistic extreme to becoming more and more uh, tempered and more and more the centrist of the umma why because the shias after the 12th imam without the guidance of a, a masum imam what happened is they become very idealistic they started to become idealistic and so you know you have the akbari shias and you have the asuli shias and so the akbari shias or the real shias they're the original most authentic the oldest shias let's say and so the akbari shias or the idealistic strand of shiism the authentic old school shiism and then sunni pragmatism and what ha- what happens though is within sunni pragmatism you within a pragmatic political order you will always need idealists to sublimate uh, some of the moral resistive impulses of the masses and so what happens is sufism or tasawwuf develops underneath the pol- pol- pragmatic uh, sunni political uh, order as the opium of the masses but what also happens under shiism is because shiism is over idealistic over time you developed an antithesis which in, is in a sufi school so instead of just sitting and waiting for the mahdi you try to create a 
type of order and a type of like you try to create like what Imam al Mahdi would try to, will create when he has come and you try to set it up as best you can through human effort still awaiting Imam al Mahdi as the so this attitude is new to, to Shiism and the, the Inqilab of uh, Khomeini is like a new development within Shiism and it is like the ultimate culmination of Shia pragmatism which is the antithesis to Shia native idealism and Shia pragmatism you know Shia pragmatism uh, Usuliism which is called the Usuli Madhab in Shiism or the Suli school this is an antithesis to, to the to the Shia idealism which is native the original Shia idealism that developed after the 12th Imam and so you have Sun, you have the Muslim Ummah and you have Sunni and Shiism, Sunni pragmatism and Shia idealism developing in polarity to each other. And eventually when they become distinct enough and foreign enough, they've developed their own antithesis within each, within each strand to, to temper, to try to temper the strand to, toward, toward mediocrity. But we need to reintegrate all of this, you know. And so that is the dialectic of materialism or the material dialectic of Muslim history. Inshallah, I will talk to you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.